Hey, all you rad dads out there. Okay, so um, welcome to the Rad Dad Show, Dave. Uh, who are you? My name's Dave Haas, and thank you for having me. Um, I found out about this podcast through my friend John Miller, who is uh, happens to be a rad dad and uh, lives here in Santa Barbara. He's originally from Pennsylvania. He's in Fire in the Radio. And we've written a bunch of songs together and worked together on some on some recordings. And he told me about what you guys are doing and uh, said, you got to do this. Like, you know, you're going to like it. So that's um, that's how I, I became aware of it. And uh, I am a singer songwriter from Philadelphia. Um, I've been in different punk rock bands and, and now play under my own name, uh, mostly with my brother and uh, put out a bunch of solo records. I just I'm working on my fifth one now. And my wife and I had our twin boys at the beginning of 2019. So they just turned two and uh, we are a month into them being two-year-old toddlers. And uh, that's sort of a nutshell um, who I am. (laughs) That's sort of the the, the platform we can jump off of, I suppose. There we go. Care to share the names of your boys? Yes, Uh, Smith and Harrison. So Smith is nine minutes older than Harrison. And uh, as you probably uh, would suspect, even those nine minutes count when it comes to birth order. Um, uh, It's weird how how even with only a nine minute gap, there's sort of an older one and a a baby, you know? (laughs) Uh, Everyone sort of takes on the similar roles, even when there's, there's mere minutes between the two children. Interesting. I think you're probably, the, so you're, you're, I was trying to count last night how many interviews we've done. So we're, so we're upward around 50 or so. And oh, so, wow. so I think you're the first, first dad that we've had that had, has had twins. So there we go. We're, we're going to anoint you with the, the first rad dad, twin dad there. Yeah. I, well, I wonder if that's sort of representative of the, um, the statistics of like how, like, is it one in 50 births are twins or I don't, I don't know. know. I'll, I I'll look it up. I'm a, I'm a yeah. science teacher, so I love those those sorts of stats yeah. and things. So I'll I'll do the research and uh, yeah, our, our our boys are identical twins, and um, the you know for people out there, I just I got a text like four weeks ago or something from Brendan Kelly, and he said I'm at the bar with Toby. You know, Toby is involved with their label and is a friend, and he was like, and I need you to settle an argument. Did you have those twins? in vitro or did you have the you know and i said no i mean i first of all identical twins i don't think it works that way they're just a freak accident and that's what our boys were we just accidentally got pregnant and they happened to be identical twins we didn't uh because usually you know i'm 43 so this would have been i was 40 when we uh this, when we discovered we were pregnant and i guess my wife's younger but um but I guess that's people wonder if you've, you know, especially with twins and multiples and so on, if you uh, if if you do in vitro or whatever. Um, and no, these were just totally uh, a bolt of wonderful lightning that hit us. <laughs> nice. So, so I guess maybe you were talking about uh, terrible. Well, not terrible twos. They're two. So is the t- moniker terrible twos true, or have you ha- had to experience that yet? Not quite. Um, no, I don't think it's been, it hasn't been terrible. I mean, there's challenges, um, but there are, there are challenges, but I, uh, no, it hasn't been terrible. Uh, I would, but they're just freshly too. Um, and because they were twins usually come early. So we had our twins at 36 weeks, um, instead of the full 40 for anyone out there who doesn't know what the, the sort of norms are, but gestation period yeah uh so and and the pediatrician told us that it would take about the first two years uh to to have them catch up developmentally i don't think that happened i think they were caught up significantly earlier with like their other kids around their age um but i do wonder if that will put the terrible twos later in the year or or terrible threes or but i don't know i i um i tend not to I'm trying not to sort of assume that any of it will be terrible um, because I think that, when, you know, what I'm learning is that 
you know, they have limited capacity to, to express their feelings when they're this age. And so tantrums and, and those kinds of things, like they just don't know how to say what they feel or say what's going on. And so uh, while a tantrum is miserable for a minute, I've been trying to look at it like, okay, well, what, what can we teach them? Um, and try, you know, the whole connect and redirect theory of like, okay, well, let's stop the tantrum by like give, showing them love, giving them a hug or whatever, trying to connect and get them out of that realm. And then uh, try to see if there's like a, a little bit of growth that you can teach them about and say, okay, well, I, I know that you're frustrated that your brother took your train, but, um, you know, next time, if you just ask dad, maybe I can come and and work this out without screaming and so you know we'll see how that works <laughs> like maybe after a year and a half of this i'll be i'll have less patience for for that sort of um you know constant uh coaching and refereeing or whatever but right now i'm 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 trying to view it that way so that i don't just slip into that uh pattern of oh this is the terrible twos and they're driving me crazy kind of thing Right. So where does that perspective or that view come from? So that you kind of talk about like that connect and redirect, but redirect, like this, there's no manual of being a dad, but it seems no, like you, you... But there are really well-written books and there is research. Um, the main, my main guy is Dan Siegel. Um, and he wrote No Drama Discipline and he wrote uh, The Whole Brain Child. And those two are, you know, those are kind of the Old and New Testament for me when it comes to, to parenting. Um, and uh, my wife is also a therapist. Um, so she, you know, this is well-worn territory for her. She studied child development and, um, you know, and also does family therapy. So, uh, we have an expert in the house uh, to begin with. And then also uh, the Dan Siegel books have been really helpful to me. Um, also being a little bit older of a dad than, than is I guess typical. I just have had a lot of friends that have gone through it. My sisters have all gone through it. Their kids are a little older and uh, you learn stuff and pick things up. And, and so, you know, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that might not have come naturally to me, my, you know, the way I was raised was, was pretty different. You know, I was raised in the eighties and a lot of this research wasn't available and um, the internet wasn't available. So you couldn't look these kinds of things up. Um, but, but uh, you know, a lot of my friends have, have give, cautioned me and given me advice and stuff and said, hey, okay, well, here's what it was like for us. And, and, you know, you sort of also watch them raise their kids and see what works and see what doesn't work as well. And, um, and, and then try to make your own manual. As you say, it doesn't come with a manual. So you sort of have to make it up as you go. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm, I'm getting my, um, my uh, tools. I like that. But I guess that, you know, you, you know, we're kind of, that's kind of maybe one of the hopes of this show too. Not saying that we're, we're an advice show at, <laughs> in any means, but it's just like, uh, you know, it's interesting for me personally, uh, for all the people that I've interviewed uh, and just getting their perspective and also getting, uh, you know, like tidbits of advice or things that they've done and kind of, kind of, you know, there, there's, there's another, you know, a little tidbit I could put in my toolbox. Here's a, here's another one that yeah. is, like, Dan Siegel, I'm familiar with, with yeah, the whole brain child, but I, I might explore some of his. So I'm, I'm your, I'm your age. I'm 43 and have uh -huh. a, have a nine-year-old. And so, oh, cool. um, yeah, definitely don't. My, my dad passed away a number of years ago. So I, so I don't have that, uh, you know, father figure in my life. So it's always a bit scary at times. And then. Uh, Did your dad pass before you had your, do you have a, a girl or a boy? Boy. Yeah. Boy. Did your dad pass before you had your boy? Yeah, it's been oh, 20, year, 20 years ago, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. My mom passed in 2004, which is actually what I wrote the first Loved Ones record about. Um, and that is a rough thing to, to be missing one of your parents when you have kids. You're like, oh, I wish they, you know, because that's sort of, you know, it's like the circle of life or whatever. Um, and not only for advice, but just to just to complete that circle, and 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 because my wife's 
mom is still around, of course, and she's very involved with the boys. And so uh, you wish that your parent could, my dad is, is still alive and he loves, loves Smith and Harrison, but uh, yeah, missing a parent is tough. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, especially with me, like I have a really, or had a really close relationship with my grandpa um, oh. and, and, and he passed away, but my, my grandma too, I have a really close relationship with her. Uh, she's turning 88 this year and um, you know we text all the time and and stuff oh, like that. <laughs> and so I yeah so I always kind of cognizant of oh my 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 son won't um, be won't have any grandparents after yeah. after my 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 grandma passes away because his mom we're not still together but his mom's her her both parents are out of the picture like one passed right. away and she didn't know her dad and and my mom just recently passed away in October. So it's oh my like this, God. this boy, so it's like, you know, it's something I think about a, a lot anyways. But let's, well, yeah, let's go. yeah, having kids definitely makes you want to connect a lot of those family tree branches that get overgrown or wither or whatever, you know, you, you sort of go like, oh, right. I have a family now, you know, you, you sort of let your parents off the hook too when, when you when those kids arrive <laughs> at least to some degree you're like uh oh they didn't know anything either <laughs> you know it's uh it's a it's an interesting thing how it all kind of starts to connect but do you consider yourself a rad dad um I don't know. Like you, you guys are the experts on, on, on this. It's your podcast. So uh, it's the phrase that you've coined. I, I would, I would ask you at the end, if I can be a rad dad, I'm, a, I'm, um, I guess, it, you know, when you, when you use the term radical, you know, the, uh, yeah, I, I, I would tend to think that's what my goal is. Um, I think that uh, the way that men have interacted and and allowed for emotional development in in their children needs work and uh i think to i mean i I get the play on words that you're maybe talking about like get rad um but you know i'm talking about being radical in in your thinking and i think that uh for a lot of people who were in world war ii or in that generation they came back from the war and they didn't talk about it and it was time to be stoic and get to work and make your bones at least you know in, in the u.s like maybe in canada too um and and ultimately uh that got passed on to the generation that fathered my generation and so they did better like my dad is in you know he's he's into evangelical christianity he was into rock and roll he was into all these touchy-feely things um that were an improvement i think to some degree on how he was parented he was he was probably parented a lot more like um you get to work and uh let's you know buck up and boys don't cry or whatever and so i think um he's in he certainly improved on that model um but if you look at how men and um, interact with the world, you know, overall in a socio-political way, uh, we're pretty bad at it. And uh, I think fathers have been pretty bad at that role too. Um, by and large, I mean, look at the mess we're in, in terms of like a, a country, in terms of the world. I mean, we're always at war and, and the shortages and, and greed. And it just, we don't let women run the show for some stupid reason uh when when they run the show so well so often uh like in my house my wife runs the show and and if i ran the show the place would be a wreck um so uh but anyways getting back to the point yeah i mean i I try to think radically about being a dad i want my kids to know how much i love them and i tell them that all the time we're very um uh, affectionate and I want them to be emotionally intelligent and emotionally uh, developed and sadly I do think that's a radical idea still um w- as compared to to the way so many so many boys are raised you know they're they're raised to with that silly false machismo thing I think that that is damaging yeah it's it's uh, I guess maybe that the new the new term maybe is toxic masculinity. Would you right. 
I agree. That's something that's relatively new for me. I, well, I guess I was introduced to it through this podcast and, and, and it's definitely, I guess, a goal to, with our group I get here is with Rad Dads is to try to just, yeah, break down those barriers, you know, with the idea that it's not uh, manly to share your feelings and not, you know, it's also to kind of squash that whole idea of that, the, the bumbling dad who's an idiot and it can't. Yeah, the Homer like, Simpson. <laughs> like, it just, just drives me crazy. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like one of our ultimate goals. So, so I guess, you know, being, being affectionate, being emotionally available, what are some other traits that make one a rad dad? Um, I think steadiness, it, it gets to into emotional steadiness as well as um, just being doing what you say you're going to do. I, I try to keep my even small promises. You know, if I tell them when we get up from nap, we're going to go to the park, even if it's a, a hurricane after nap, for whatever reason, it's difficult to get to the park. I try to keep those promises and, and uh, I try to make sure that, that they know I can, they can count on me. Um, especially because I'm, you know, with the pandemic, we've had the, the blessing of, me being home I'm not touring obviously and haven't toured for almost a year now um but I know I got to go back to work sooner or later which means I have this built-in detachment with the job I do which I'm not happy about I'm not um excited about it and, and I've talked at length with various other touring friends of mine who had kids I mean oddly my friend Jay is in bad religion and his son Miles was in my band for a, over a year maybe it was two years and so that was a really interesting thing to sort of see to have miles in my band and see the byproduct of the raising of his you know of how his dad impacted him and his dad happens to be my friend uh that was an interesting dynamic and uh i've gone to jay for different advice um of what to and what not to do um and he's very frank and very open with uh, his his struggles and journey and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think being steady is is a big goal. I mean, that was that's a goal for my own therapy. It's a it's why uh, yeah, it's another reason why I go to to a therapist. It's a it's a reason why I take an SSRI. I have a, a low dose of. Um, uh, Lexapro that I'm on and that was within the last year or so I, I wanted to get my moods steadier um, for my sons you know so that that they could understand that mom and dad were something like a true north for them and that they're they could allow their moods to go fluctuate and go crazy because they're children um, but mom and dad for the most part they could count on to be steady so that's another like sort of daily hourly and sometimes minute by minute goals <laughs> remain steady it, it's definitely a, a theme too you know when I ask that question that one that's one that comes up a, a lot and it's also one that I think is really important too growing up uh, my dad really wasn't there uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the time uh, dealt with addiction issues and whatnot and, and my mom you know being a single mom raising three kids um, got to a point in her life where you know she wasn't really around either and so you know, not not having that though the steadiness from my parents is something that I really want to want to change um, yeah you know for my son um what are the most rewarding aspects of being a dad um I I think it's a cliche but I think see re-seeing the world through their eyes is is uh it, it's something you hear a lot of people say and when I didn't have kids I kind of thought all right, I, I guess you're telling me like the ocean and the birds are that much more exciting. And they really are. Um, as you watch your kids discover the world and they sort of start to put things together and you, you inevitably, if, if you're trying to be dialed in are more aware, you're like, Oh, look, there's an airplane. That is cool. There's a, there's a, there's a vessel flying through the air it carries people and things that's kind of crazy you know <laughs> and because you're you know you're you're seeing it for them so that you can direct them up into the sky or whatever or birds or nature and i mean that's really rewarding um and uh for me it's been their sense of humor the things that they find funny are are it's such a trip their, their personalities come online pretty early and um 
you know, one of our big go-tos is Donald Duck cartoons and they laugh at most of the same things I find funny. Um, fart you know, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. They love, they love fart jokes. They love, um, they love uh, when Donald Duck gets exasperated by Chip and Dale, which I think will be something that mostly that'll be what their life is. I being Donald Duck and they being Chip and Dale, but um, yeah, that all that stuff is really, really fun. Um, and I think just, tr I try generally, I think like this might be something I do because of songwriting, but I try to pan out often. Um, and you do that with a song too. You might be getting really myopic about a little bridge chord or a lyric or something. And then I try to go like, okay, let's get up to a thousand feet or a hundred feet above and look down. Like, is this something anybody wants to listen to? And I try to do that in life throughout. And, and with my kids, um, when, when I, when I pan out, um, I try to think of, I mean, dad is such a big influence, you know, uh, mom and dad, they steer your worldview. And so I try to get up out of myself when I'm frustrated by the fact that they just poured all the pretzels onto the floor and go like, well, again, what, what would I want? how would I want my dad to have reacted to that? And my dad's actually pretty steady. He's a pretty steady guy. He's a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. And so instead of me Donald ducking about it, I'm like, oh, okay, let's, let's get in here and clean these pretzels up. So it's, um, it's a, that's a joyful thing, you know, to, to kind of know that, um, you know, it sort of ties into being like a singer too, because you spend all this time writing songs and performing and like, you're like sort of for the formative years, like, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And now you have these two, in my case, these two boys who they're going to hang on every one of our words. And so suddenly like the audience and all of that, listen to me energy is kind of gone. I, I'm not worried about it as much. Like I'll, obviously I love playing music, but my, I have these two, uh, um, the very malleable souls that are hanging on all of our words. And so that, that the weight of that is, is really cool to know like, all right, well, I can, I can kind of do a good job if I really try. I mean, the, the flip side of that is I could fuck this up, which, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what keeps you up at night. But, you know, I'm trying to look at it like, well, I could, I could do a good job with them. And, 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 they could go into their their um, teenage years and their early adulthood without addiction issues and, and self-esteem issues and a lot of the stuff that I sustained. Um, that would be that would be a thrill to 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 have that kind of positive impact on two little human beings. Mm, I like that. In what way has fatherhood changed you? In almost every way. Um, the biggest one, I think, is just uh, having to not focus on my own endeavors primarily. Um, it's had me restructure my time, restructure my priorities. Um, you know, they take sort of primacy. They're, they're, the, they're the main thing on my mind. And, and their development and their safety and their um, well-being is my main concern it's plan a plan b is oh I, I i make up songs and uh i i use them in whatever way i can to to make money and and play for people and that's a wonderful blessing but it's not my only focus anymore uh it's uh, it's it's sort of like work you know I, I get up and come out here and i work i do things like this or i work on songs or i record or whatever and, um, and then I'll go and play. But my main uh, concern and consideration is being a dad. That's my main job. That's, that's been the major change. And then in every other way, it changes you. You know, your, your uh, main car is a minivan. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you're very aware of all this new equipment, you know, whether that's diapers and how they work or various swings and, and, and little bikes and things like you, you suddenly know all this stuff about all that, that I hadn't even really, really interfaced with very much.
Right. Yeah. Wait, wait till I get involved in sports, you know, you know soccer dad and, and whatnot. Yeah. Right. You'll know all these plays. Like my buddy, Brendan is that way. He's, he's been the coach. He's, his kids are older. His kids are teenagers. And um, he is like a soccer expert. He, he, you know, just by virtue of coaching them and being involved in it, it's a trip. Like I've, I've hung out with him when I've been back in Philly to visit and we, I've just like spent the Saturday with him. I'm like, what are you doing today? Oh, I've got this. And I'm, like, I'm just going to ride along. And he has all these dad friends and he goes in and gets the cones out and he knows all the plays and where <laughs> the nets are. It's really cool. I was like, yo, this is, this is fun. And this was before I had kids. Yeah. Um, and he was like, you'll see, you'll see, this is what you're, so a big part of your life's going to be. Yeah, it will be for sure. I, I always, I said, I think it was an interview with uh, KJ from, from Chicks Dig It. And we were talking about hockey or I don't know what it was. I said, if I ever won the, you know, the lottery, I would uh, get all, I would, I would start like a punk rock dad festival, you know, just, <laughs> where it's just yeah. like dad band. We had uh, Greg from Bouncing Souls and, you know, I was like, oh yeah, it'd be great to have Bouncing Souls play. And then in like the, the other tent have Playdate. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Playdate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. The, him yeah. and his wife. And it's, uh, it would be. They're old fun. friends of mine. I worked for them. I was their roadie for, for years and they were big, very, they were very instrumental in me making my own music. They really encouraged me. And Greg, when I toured with the Bouncing Souls, he was my roommate. Like I would room with him. Um, and so it, it was great. I, I went to see the Souls, at, maybe it was at the end of 2019. They were playing in Philly and I was there. And uh, they played a matinee and then we all went to see the Misfits at, uh, at the, um, the, the giant hockey arena in Philadelphia. And most of our conversation was about all of our kids. Everybody had had, had kids by, or you know, four of us or five of us in, in this group. And you know, we're watching the misfits and, and hanging out backstage. And, and we used to get into so much trouble. But now it was really sweet to like sit there and gush about our children and be looking at photos and laughing about various um, peculiar situations we'd been in already. And it was really cool. It was like a full circle friendship moment that's funny like i think the when i interviewed him too he was he was like 10 minutes late i think he was it was the same sort of thing he's like sorry i'm late i was yeah. shoveling snow outside blah blah it was it was really funny actually yeah. i think the first time i saw you was actually opening for the miss uh, not miss it's opening for the souls uh yeah 20, i want to say 2012 at the starlight yeah. and then i've seen you yeah. a few times you, you played denizen hall here and then you also, I, th I think the last time I saw you was uh, the Needle when you when you were doing Dave House and the Mermaid show. Oh yeah, we that played was there with. Was it the Bronx tour? Yeah, we yeah, were going yeah. tour with the Bronx. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Anyway, have you done have you done an interview with uh, Joby, their guitar player? No, no. Some, sometimes He's I don't know who's a dad, right? Like so, yeah. you're, 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 I should uh, yeah. I should reach out, yeah. Um, he and, and also Dave Hidalgo has played drums for them. He's played drums for me. He's actually in social distortion. He's got two kids and, and he's, he, he's given me some good advice over the years. He's uh, his kids are, yeah, they're all, well, they're, I guess they're, they're late. They're almost to be teenage, right around teenage uh, or getting there, you know, one of them. And uh, he would be a good interview too. He's, he's terrific. Oh, I'm hearing that. Did you have any fears about being a dad? Oh yeah, tons. Um, uh, m most of them sort of dissipated when my wife became pregnant. It, oddly enough, I mean, I, I did still have lingering anxiety and fear, um, and I still do. You know, I, I the most ex the people I love the most are the most susceptible to danger. So you're in this weird pick pickle all the time. They're they're a danger to themselves. They're a danger to each other. Um, their li lives are fragile and I love them so much. So, so the idea that something could hurt, hurt them or happen to them is, uh, is terrifying, but I was more afraid of how it would impact my life. Um, before we, we, my, before my wife did get pregnant, I was worried about our time and I was worried about, do we have enough money? And I was worried about all the things you worry about. And most of that sort of dissipated and you go like, okay, well, they're coming now and let's, uh, let's figure it out. And we still are just sort of figuring it out. Um, as we're hoping to come back online with playing live, we're trying to figure out next year, you know, and, and so it, 
we're starting to visit pre-schools and, and, you know, with our map and stuff and look around and see how they are. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to um, judge them and so on. And there's some fear involved with that. But uh, you're just making it up as you go. If you have a good feeling about the play, you just sort of put one to the other and, and do the next best thing, the next right thing. And, um, and that's about it. But yeah, I mean, I have fears now. I had fears then. And, you know, generally, though, whenever you follow your fear, uh, your, the results are, are twisted. Um, and I find that to be true in almost every aspect of life. I mean, you know what's going on in America. Um, and the mongering of fear politically has put things into such a crazy situation. And I think you could, you could take that model and, and extrapolate that out over tons of other scenarios. Like when you're afraid, um, you often make bad decisions. And I, and I think you, it's, it's about trying to get that fear under control and, and try to face things and, and do your best and be willing to make mistakes um, and own them. You know, I think that's another thing. That's another sort of radical idea for men, uh, sadly, is um, it's hard to admit when you're wrong, I guess. And, you know, I mean, for me, I'm wrong all the time. I'm wrong <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and uh, embracing that is, is freeing because it, it allows you to learn, you know, oh, I was wrong about that. Shit. Well, that's the 10th thing today I've been wrong about. And yeah. the 10th thing, hopefully I learned from, uh, you know, so yeah, fear is there, but just like in any other aspect of life, um, you know, my goal is to, is to get that fear under control and, and push through. Can you describe quickly the relationship with your dad? Yeah, my dad uh, and I have a great relationship now. Um, my dad worked hard. He had a regular 40 hour a week job that he, that he had for, he just retired and he, um, had the job for 43 years or something, you know, same worked, uh, in, uh, for a stone quarry and, um, blacktop company and so on. Um, and he had kids young. I was his, I'm his first. He's, uh, there's three sisters behind me and then my brother, Tim. So five kids. Um, and my dad is, he's steady and reliable and he's good natured and, um, and a kind man who's trying to grow and, and learn as life goes on. When I was a kid though, he was very taken with um, evangelical Christianity. He was super into that world. And I think along with that and the fear that they sort of have going on structures I was involved in, which a lot of church, a Christian school, a lot of Bible. I think a lot of that, my mom and dad were afraid I would end up like people in my neighborhood and, and maybe my mom's brothers who were getting into various trouble in their early twenties and stuff. They all pretty much panned out okay you know um and so that fear i think pushed him towards the church and that and the church sat down real heavy on me and so i think that that made our relationship really difficult uh for a lot of the formative years you know a lot of like the late early child or what am i saying late early child? i guess what's it called when you're like seven or nine what, what's that state i don't know good question i <laughs> that's where my it's son like is you know, ele elementary years. Years. yeah but yeah elementary years into high school and in um teenage years those were tough because i was pushing back against all of that i i um my punk rock sensibilities kicked in and uh my anti establishment or anti um authority kind of bent kicked in my dad and i butted heads um but you know life has a way of of working itself out and we lost he lost his wife my mom in 2004 and that was a leveling experience that was brutal um and i think it taught him a lot of lessons about life and and uh he's now happily remarried and, and is a great grandpa to the nine 
grandchildren of his. And a lot of that stuff has sort of worked itself out. But yeah, there were difficult years in there where um, my worldview and his worldview were, were not in sync. Is that, do you think that will change being cognizant of that? Will, will that change the relationship with your kids? Or do, Definitely. You think it, or do you think it's inevitable that you know, kids kind of rebel against their parents at some point? And... Well, well knowing, knowing that and what, that, what purpose that serves will in, in navigating it. I mean, that's naturally what has to happen in order for them to become adults. It doesn't have to be um, it, in the same way that, that uh, understanding what, what is happening to toddlers. Um, if you understand it, hopefully you can wrap your head around it and navigate instead of just being frustrated and desperate about it. Uh, knowing that what's happening in the teenage years, why it's so that they'll form into adults. They're pushing back against the structure so they can sort of self-actualize. Okay, that's what we want. It's just, it'll be bumpy, but it's part of the ride. And that, the other thing is I don't have um, dogmatic belief systems. Other than like, I think Tom Petty is the best. I don't, you know. <laughs> um, but you Dad, know, we, Dad, we don't want to listen to Tom Petty anymore. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. That's the only CD in the minivan. Right, right. It's full moon fever or nothing. Um, no, I, I, I don't have those things. I'm not convinced of, uh, um, you know, religious conclusions, and so they can develop those on their own. I would prefer that you know, that that's their own walk. Um, so I don't think we'll run up against that. I mean, my, some of my other fears though are, 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 um, you know, finding drugs, you know, drugs these days are, are killers, you know, um, fentanyl and all this, all this terrible stuff that has proliferated is, is what, that's what I would fear. So I'm hoping that over the term of their development, um, they're attached and secure and don't turn to those uh, addictive tendencies that I'm sure are in there. Both my wife and I have experienced those. And so that's a terrifying thought to know that the, our DNA is in them and we partied a lot and, and, and me in particular, it got ugly. Um, so, you know, that's a concern but hopefully we're laying the ground now that, that where that's at least avoidable. I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. Last two questions here. Uh, this one is just, uh, just about the band and or your solo stuff. What, what, what's in the future for, for you? Wonderful Songs band. and playing them out to anybody who wants to listen. That It's sort of um, the, the interesting thing is by virtue of, having the children and having having a limited amount of time to work every day i work every day at it and so i have tons and tons of songs my brother and i have been writing i think this year we'll write more songs than i've written in all of my career <laughs> just by saying like okay we have songwriting time at this time and it's over at this time and so it contracts and you're focused and you have to finish songs that's that's your job tim or dave you know uh so that's that's the plan and then to to do what's best for them with regard to the whole family so you know we have a lot of juggling to do we live in an expensive place um that's hard to you know buy a house here it's almost pretty much out of reach so that presents some challenges and uh, my wife is a therapist so she keeps her hours and has people counting on her it's 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 cute like i say to the boys like when mommy goes to work i say mommy's going to help people that's what mommy does for work it's really sweet to to be able to say that um so we have that to navigate and um and then how to you know tour uh in a balanced way you know how not to leave for months and uh to stay engaged with their life and make sure that dad being steady is still a reality even though i'm in edmonton or or berlin or tokyo or something so that'll that'll be a challenge but um yeah generally that's that seems to be the program i said this before 2020 too and uh life had a way of of um of changing my my plans so uh it, who knows <laughs> 
right yeah. right well all the best the best you know in the future you know i hope that this pandemic kind of ends soon you know a lot of you know musicians that we've talked about have have been really grateful for the time that they got to spend with their family and stuff but also you know i, I know it's difficult uh, you know financially like if i look at well, you know some of my friends like one of my friends owns the starlight room where oh where, where you played you know a number of times and and they're it's come to a point where they almost have to close the door which is one of the most formative clubs i want to say for me yeah. you know that's where i saw my first punk rock show over 25 years ago and I, it would just be yeah it's sad you know a lot of my friends sad, yeah you know, i mean they're in the arts community in it and um, there's not a ton of support and so i just you know hope you know all positive thoughts for for all those kind of affected for sure yeah i hope um i hope we can come up with a way just as a society and as a species to uh to honor the things that kind of really keep us going for me music has been such um, a life raft in in not only just in my whole life but also in in pandemic and uh it's true for arts it's true for all the creative endeavors and you know to to not to not support them is is at our own peril so i'm hoping i'm hoping we can get over this hump it's uh it's really complicated yeah uh last question dave any fatherly words of wisdom to any of the rad dads out there or any of the new dads listening uh i would say if i had to give advice it's don't listen to a rock and roll singer when you're looking for fatherly advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say, I would say that, um, I would say try to try to learn as much as you can about how children develop and try to honor that, um, along the way. And, and, you know, I heard some advice that I, that was really cool. Um, you know, Joey Cape is a, is a friend of mine. And, and he said to my friend Donald and I that we both, Donald and I both have twins. And we both live here in town and he lives here in town. And he said, uh, you know, your day, he was talking to Donald, like your day is pretty great. You structure your day how you want. And, and you get to, if you want to watch the Mandalorian or, or, you know, have a beer or whatever it is you're into, you do it. They don't have that control. Try to make each one of their days rad the way that you make your day rad. And I was like, wow, that's such, that's so interesting to think of their little perspective and like, has their day going well? Are they excited? Are they drawing? Are they, are they playing with trains? Are they, are they playing with a doll or something? Is that what's compelling to them? And, and try to like help facilitate that. That that was good advice to me. Um, but yeah, I would say like seek out, seek out some of the science and some of the studies that have been done about child child development. And the Dan Siegel books are are just so crucial to me. Um, and, and the way he looks at it, it helps you really understand what's happening with your kid, and helps you read just adjust your approach. I think, uh, I think it's really helpful. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Dave. Really appreciate uh, giving up, giving up the, the hour. I, under, I know how, how busy a two year old, never mind two of them are. And oh, they're great. They're just, they're drawing on their little art easel right now. They're drawing, uh, well, they're coloring in the trains that my wife draws and, uh, they're just very much about Thomas, the tank engine. So it's all good, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for doing what you do. I think it's super important and I'm glad to be uh, involved and glad to be interviewed by you. I, I, it's such a treat to, to talk about um, something else other than music, you know, and something that I'm like super passionate about. It's, it's, it's really a thrill. Thank you. Passion shows. Thanks, Dave. Enjoy your day. All right, man. You too. See ya. Take care.